to another IAEI News Live. My name is Thomas Dimitrovich, and today's discussion on IAEI News Live is going to be on equipment protection, the NEC, NFPA 70E, NFPA 70B, how they all interrelate, and it all starts now. Okay, well that was fast. I think I uh, have to put a little bit more of a delay there. So welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome to another Tuesday. And yes, we are live today. And we're going to be talking about uh, we're going to be talking about equipment protection. But I want to share some news first. Uh, so you know, um, if you do some if you do some reading and and you know, we in the United States, uh, in the U.S., and those countries, Canada, um, Mexico, I would even say, uh, Mexico is doing a pretty good job. But we're adopting national electrical codes. We have enforcers out there. We have trained workforces uh, that are coming along very well, in my opinion. And the statistics that I am aware of are usually driven by um, the departments uh, within the United States, uh, you know, Consumer Product Safety Commission. Um, we have the Department of Labor who puts their Department of Labor and Statistics who puts their information together. NFPA gathers information. Um, but if you just do a search on electric shock, unfortunately, hey, Michael Hopkins, good to see you, my friend. So if you do a search on electrocutions and whatnot, you'll find that other countries experience uh, electrocutions as well. In fact, there was one, um, and this one was an interesting one, a woman electrocuted while vacuuming her artificial lawn has her life saved by her Puma rubber sliders. I thought that was an interesting, this is a 36-year-old who said that she felt a massive tingle as she was unplugging her um, her vacuum? And this is, I believe, in um, I believe this is in the UK. So it's it's West Yorkshire, um, Halifax, Halifax, West Yorkshire. Uh, the resulting shock flung her towards a nearby wall before she was rushed to a hospital, where doctors told her that those $30 pair of Puma sliders saved her life. And there's a picture of her carrying those. Those I, I can only hear but can't see video. Benjamin, um, well, hopefully you can see me, Benjamin. Uh, but, uh, but, but hopefully you should be able to uh, see us on LinkedIn. So anyway... Um, Yep, there it is. I'm just checking out the. Uh, yep, so uh, I got, I got video out there on uh, on LinkedIn. Video not available. Not sure why. Uh, it is out there on LinkedIn. I see it here, and um, it's going out. You know what it might be. Uh, it looks. Oh well, no, no, it it looks good. So anyway, hopefully you can get that figured out there on LinkedIn. If not, go out there to YouTube. Go to YouTube, go to uh, www.youtube.com slash user, uh, U-S-E-R, slash I-A-E-I International. And we will see you there. But this one here, um, this, this individual says that she had finished vacuuming the grass and went to unplug the extension, and the black or the back plastic bit must have been loose. She says that she didn't know and grabbed it and it, and it fell off while she held the, well, she had a hold of the plug and she got electrocuted. She felt the shock and she got flung back. She says the pain was like a dull ache and a massive tingle through her body and it was like electricity going through her arms. Uh, and there's a picture she's using, she's actually vacuuming and it's a uh, it's not real grass it's uh it's fake so um but uh she has her rubber 
her rubber uh, Puma slippers on, and uh, those gave her enough insulation. So, anyway, so that was the UK, right? And, and you know, sometimes you can say, well, you know, we're doing some crazy things and vacuuming our backyard, but hey, you know, we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't, ex we shouldn't uh, expect to be electrocuted. All right, so the other one was uh, contractor sustained an injury from electrocutions in Wyndham. Uh, in this case, it was a private contractor taken to the hospital after being electrocuted in Wyndham. The individual was working on an electric pole and subsequently electrocuted, well, which caused him to fall off of a ladder. So, you know, uh, this is Bradford County. So this um, this here is in the states. But um, in these in some of these incidents, when you're on uh, on, when you're up high on a ladder and whatnot, uh, fall protection is very important. Uh, if you fall off of a ladder, maybe maybe the fall helped you release yourself, um, but it's that abrupt stop at the end that can do a lot more damage. Uh, and what I'm getting to is this one here. So there was a report uh, that was published. 30 people are killed by electrocution every day. In India this um, this report looked at from uh, electrocutions from 2011 to 2020 and it says um, so there are apparently 10 people that were just recently electrocuted in during an event uh, most of them and and uh, most of them were in their teens. They're en route to a temple when a suspected short circuit in the in the truck uh, cut short their lives and left over a dozen seriously injured. Uh, on April 27th, eight men and three teenage boys were killed in yet another tragic incident during a religious procession uh, when a temple chariot came in contact with high tension electricity lines. Now, what they say is that electrocution has been a major cause of death in India with the number rising every year. According to NCRB data, almost 1.1 people have lost their lives. LAKH, I'm not sure what LAKH stands for, lost their lives due to electrocution from 2011 to 2020, the, la the last year for which figures are available. So that translates into nearly 11,000 deaths every year or 30 fatalities every day. Think about that, 11,000 deaths every year in India due to electricity. Electrocution deaths have increased a whopping 50% from 8,945 in 2011 to 13,446 in 2020. When we look at, how, at what our practice here is in the United States, and in Mexico, and in Canada, and other countries, you know, the UK and others. These, these uh, uh, it, it seems like there are some countries that, that can use some help with regard to uh, safety, and I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's, if it's installation requirements, I don't know if it's qualified persons, I don't know if it's inspections, but 11,000 deaths every year to electricity. 30 fatalities every day on average. That's just not good numbers, in my opinion. I'm just saying. Um, the 2020 figure includes over, over 2,000 females and nearly 1,700 minors with 2,412 deaths. Um, this event alone accounted for almost a fifth of the total fatalities in 2020. MP was followed by, so, so what are the major causes of electrocution deaths? This is an interesting report. The major causes of electrocution deaths are short circuit, live wires, snapping during floods and water logging, and poorly constructed electricity poles, loosely hanging power lines, a common sight in India roads, uh, also amplify the risk of accidents during religious processions. Hey, Ryan, doing good, brother. Glad to see everybody there. So we got Ryan Jackson in the house. Uh, we got Jody Wages. Oh, there it is. Lock a look now Indian. A hundred thousand. They fixed the the price at five. Okay, excellent. Thanks for looking into that, Jody. 
So, so here's the thing. This is the International Association. So think about how can we help those in other countries like India and others. And these are sounds like rural areas. And, and I'm sure there are a lot of rural areas in, in many jurisdictions. But this is, this is just absolutely phenomenal on how many people our lives are, are taken every year due to um, the use of electricity. So keep that in mind that, um, you know, we can, we can um, somehow, you know, we take for granted. We take for granted our, uh, in, in your and I, in environment. We, I think, in my opinion, take it for granted the, um, the enforcement and the level of expertise in, in installers uh, and awareness on electrical safety. So... You know, we're all doing really great things. And we argue, what, about, uh, you know, GFCI requirements in, in the NEC, compatibility concerns. We argue about uh, AFCIs. We argue about working space and a lot of things in the code. When If you just shifted gears and realize you really got it pretty doggone good here uh, when, when you are in locations that are enforcing. Yes, Willie Snyder, the, the, the um, it's a shame on, on the stories that you get that drive code changes. Uh, and hopefully one day, and I, I think it was, I think it was, um, you know, it was, it was Kevin Arnold, uh, a, a gentleman uh, that uh, we were just at a meeting, and he made a statement that, and, and, and it really causes, I think, some of us to think about this. A lot of codes and standards that we see and changes are driven by statistics. Right. So if you look, if you look at books like 70E, Annex, Informative Annex K, if you have a copy of 70E and just go out to Informative Annex K, it's the general categories of electrical hazards and, and understand that 98%, about 98% of fatal occupational electrical injuries are electric shock injuries. And then they'll tell you in here that it's not just electrical worker, it's other trades that are experiencing these fatalities and, and being injured by electricity. So we're not here just for us, we're here for everybody else as well. And um, it's just amazing that when you look at how in our world, in, in, you know, in the United States, Mexico, Canada, I, I'm just going by, and, I, and I'm sure the UK and, and Japan and, and those locations where you have some, some level of enforcement, some level of um, criteria, um, you wonder how some areas just fall down. You know, how, how do we end up with that those types of statistics in anywhere globally uh, in today's today's uh, in today's world, but uh, you know it's out there, and we all have to work together regardless of where we're at. So, but that's not I mean that that's a uh, I just wanted to at least share that statistic uh, that I think is um, is is a, a, a port, uh, an important part of um, it's an important part of our industry, and we've got to think globally. We've got to think about how do we reach more people. And I think these types of venues, I know that we'll have Felix Sandoval from South America on here. We, I, I, we've had, uh, I've had people from Japan, people from the UK, people from Kuwait, uh, from, from Saudi Arabia, from other countries who watch these, these programs. We all have to work together. So hopefully we can do that. So today's topic is, is, is an exciting topic. It is um, basically, we're going to talk about equipment protection. Hey, Kenny Young, thanks for the feedback, brother. Thanks for the feedback. Uh, last week, I had to record that session. And um, again, another allergy attack. I tell you what, I can't stand. This guy right here, these nodes, my 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 um, my allergies. 
one of these days, and I and I refuse to get tested for allergy. You know how they do all the different tests and everything. Uh, I just live with it because it only impacts me a few times a year. But when it does, as you can see, it's not. It's ungood. Hey, John Doss, you're never late for the party, buddy. Remember, these are all recorded. You can always go back and catch the beginning. Go take a look at the beginning of this one. Talked a little bit about some uh, some examples of electrocution. So what we're going to talk about is equipment protection. Now, remember, the equipment protection is plays an important role in electrical safety. The National Electrical Code helps us understand how to install products and solutions, right? The... Uh, the NEC gives us, uh, um, gives us the installation requirements. NFPA 70B tells us how to maintain those. Hey, Sarasota, Florida in the house. Thanks for joining. Sarasota, I used to live down in uh, Tampa, St. Pete area. So uh, I used to go down to Sarasota all the time. So anyway, remember that equipment, think of the trilogy. You have installation requirements in the National Electrical Code, NFPA 70. You have 70B for maintenance, and then you have 70E for safe work practices. They work together very closely. So here's the thing, what you have to always remember is when you install something per the National Electrical Code, various aspects of ratings of the equipment it's not a set it and forget it concept because your power distribution system will change. And if you think about, um, if you think about the, 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 the parameters like available fault current, um, voltage rarely, I would say you would have to worry about, but fault currents definitely do change. Um, and that, those impact interrupting ratings. They impact short circuit current ratings. That could impact selective coordination performance uh, of the overcurrent protective devices on and um, ground fault currents, right? So we have to constantly make sure that as our system changes, the, the available fault current values are compared with interrupting ratings and short circuit current ratings. Uh, so, but in the proper application of equipment, you've got to also think about just the standard ampere ratings. For protection of conductors, protection of, of equipment, uh, terminal blocks, whatever their current ratings are, proper voltage ratings, equipment evaluation is not just about the short circuit current or short circuit current ratings and things of that nature. Uh, equipment evaluation and protection, they're standard ampere ratings. So are your conductors being protected at their impacity? Uh, did somebody make a modification to the set points on the uh, trip units, right? Uh, for, did they put the correct fuses back in when, say, one may have opened? Transient voltages. You've got to think about, about surge protection of equipment as well. So you think about uh, transient voltage events. Uh, not, uh, you know, you can have, you also, you, you, have, uh, when it, when you have the voltage swells. Uh, voltage sags could be dip, could be bad for equipment as well. So you have a voltage swell and a voltage sag. Those are um, uh, variations in voltage above, say, rated values for a period of time. Transient voltage events are those um, like capacitor switching, those sub-cycle events that um, are very similar to uh, water, drops of water on a bar of soap. Eventually, they'll eat through uh, the bar of soap, right? So these transient events can uh, uh, damage electronics, whether they be drives, uh, smoke detectors, uh, AFCIs, GFCIs, um, any type of uh, motor control that's uh, digital in nature or any electronics within the plant uh, environment or your residential environment. So you got to think about uh, evaluating your equipment and, and keeping it protected, not just for high fault currents, but also voltage, ampere ratings, and over voltages, which includes transient voltages, voltage swells, and then under voltages as well, voltage sags. What does a voltage sag do? 
Vaulted sags will uh, make your motors work harder, right? They may draw more current, especially if it's a sag and then a swell and you have voltage variations. You have inrush currents that may trip an overcurrent protective device, could cause maintenance personnel to think they need to change and adjust the uh, settings on overcurrent protective devices, reducing level of, levels of protection that are provided. And then you have your whole aspect of the role that an overcurrent protective device plays in arc reduction. So equipment, again, can carry normal load currents. Um, any type of uh, excessive heat can reduce the life of equipment. So again, it's, it's, there's um, the, the continued operation of your power distribution system as it performs throughout its life. It's not an NEC thing. I may not relate that to 70E because it's just operation, but from a maintenance perspective, 70B, these are types of events that you need to be thinking about um, and understand how your equipment is subjected to uh, voltage sags, voltage swells, things of that nature. How many times uh, those drove overcurrent devices to open, whether it be a fuses or circuit breakers, right? So capturing that information, whether it be uh, the old fashioned way of pad and paper or the newfangled way of, uh, of digitally uh, capturing events. Seattle is in the house. Thanks for joining us. And we have a LinkedIn user who remains anonymous. All right, so short circuit current readings. Um, important piece of the puzzle when it comes to safety, uh, sa um, when it comes to your equipment performing uh, as designed. So I'm just going to have to open the, uh, go to my videos, because there's a couple videos I want to show you. All right, so in, in this scenario, I'm going to show you two things. Um, whoop, whoop, whoop. The first one, the first event I, wanna, I want to share with you is a, what we call the cable whip. This is the circuit. We have 45,000 amps of uh, symmetrical amps available um, at the beginning of 90 foot of 2 watt conductor. So what you're going to see is 2 watt conductor, and it's going to experience a short circuit that lasts for one cycle, and one cycle only. Hopefully, um, you'll be able to hear the, um, you'll be able to hear this. Uh, so anyway, we're going to have one cycle of, of, uh, of clearing time and two odd conductor. So if you do the math with the length of conductor, you've got about 26,000 amps of current flowing through this two odd conductor. And, um, and this is what happens. That's one cycle. One cycle of current. Let's play that again. One cycle of current. So that's a lot of that's a lot of force being placed on a conductor. And we call that the cable whip for obvious reason demonstration which demonstrates the magnetic forces that are present in the power distribution system when short circuits flow and that was around 26,000 amps flowing for one cycle and think about some circuit breakers can let all current flow for up to 30 cycles 30 cycles now <laughs> this is here's my thing Think about this. 30 cycles of that. And we talk about torque. We talk about 110.14 in the National Electrical Code about terminations. We talk about 
mounting equipment to the wall, mounting your mounting your your doors and your structure, anything that lets current pass through it. Terminal blocks, receptacles, a busway, cable. What else? Um, a, a circuit breaker with 30 cycles, transfer switches need to deliver fault current. A panel boards, switchboard, switch gear, anything that lets current pass through it has to be able to hold it together under all of those magnetic forces. That is a significant, a significant amount of energy and force that you have to be able to withstand. So, so what we're going to do next is we're going to demonstrate. So, here, so there's, there's the details. The peak current, and I'm going to show you a waveform of what we mean by peak. Let's, let's just do that. What do we mean by peak? You have to find a waveform. Just keep, that, keep this in mind. The peak current was 48,000 amps. There we go. All right, what we mean by peak is that first half cycle. This is a sine wave. This is approximately, well, this is one, two, three, four, five, six cycles. So, so this demonstration was one cycle of current. That's what we let through. And that peak was 40, I don't know what it was. Was it 46,000 amps? Hold on. Um, 46,000 amps. Trying to find my numbers. I think it was 46,000 amps. But in any case, uh, that so so whenever you think about we're letting one cycle through that first half cycle the slope the slope of the sine wave goes like from something like this to like this so my slope changes considerably for a very short period of time I have a large change in current that first half cycle are the, is the mechanical force that's on that cable so those are the mechanical forces that um, uh, that you're seeing on the cable. Now, uh, I can't do that yet. I'm, gonna, I'm queuing up the next one. So now what we're going to do is we're going to do the exact same example, except that we are going to show you what current limitation does. So we're going to put a current limiting fuse in series with this circuit. And, and I'm going to show you what the, the impact of current limitation has on the stress and forces of every component in a power distribution system. What, you're, what we're going to demonstrate is what is being shown here. The red little triangle, this little red triangle, is the only energy that's going to be let through. The peak current, which was 46 or so thousand amps, is going to be reduced to a very to something lower, and we'll we'll see the numbers when we're when we're done. And the duration will change. So what does that do? That reduces the magnetic forces on the equipment, and it reduces the heat. So the peak value coming down reduces the magnetic forces, and the reduction in duration reduces the heat. Now let's take a look at the circuit. So this is the circuit. I got 45,000 amps. A 200 amp class RK1 fuse, 26,000. Here is the the, the, the curve. So when we are, the 26,000 amps is well into the current limiting region of the fuse. And what we mean by that is the current limiting region begins 
where the fuse curve crosses 0.01 seconds. And as you move further to the right, you are in current limitation. And what, what, you know what we use to help us understand the new peak values are what we call let through curves. So if we took this fuse curve and opened up the let, let the, blah, 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 blah. the let through curves, <laughs> this curve shows us what happens when current is to the right of where that fuse crosses 0 0.01 seconds. So what this tells us, if we take that 26,000 amps that's passing through it, and we go up to the AB line and over, the peak without the fuse is 58,000 amps. Okay? So the peak without the fuse, that's what the AB line tells us. And remember what we saw uh, from looking at the waveform. I thought it was like 48 or something like that. And, and that difference between that 58 from reading this and the 48 is um, due to these, right? So it's due to the eyes trying to use this table. So what does the, uh, the peak mean? So if I go to the fuse size, 200 amp line, which is that diagonal, I go up and over. That over number tells me that the peak for when 26,000 amps flows through this fuse, the peak current won't be 58,000. It's only going to be around 12,000 amps. So I'm reducing it from 58 to 12. So that means that I'm taking that first peak and I'm moving it down to a, a, a much lower number, and it's going to clear within a quarter cycle. Okay, so let's do this. Let me show you something. So now let's take a look, and I'm going to tell you, this is that same test using a current limiting fuse. So let's just take a look at it, and I'm going to tell you to focus in on the end of this conductor right here. In fact, I'm going to get me out of the picture. And it's over. We're going to see that one more time. Let's watch that one more time. Tell me that's not cool. So that is what current limitation does in a circuit. <laughs> David Smith in the house. So that's what, that's what current limitation does in the circuit. It reduces the amount of magnetic forces that are imposed on the power distribution system. So when we talk about short circuit current ratings, and we talk about um, we talk about equipment that say is uh, rated for a two hundred thousand amp short circuit current rating. What does that mean? That two hundred thousand amps can pass through this equipment and it can handle the magnetic forces when protected by, right? They'll always tell you it's 200,000 amp short circuit current rating when protected by a specific, either a fuse or a circuit breaker. And the reason that is, is because of this right here. The overcurrent protected device will not let that equipment see the full first half cycle. It's going to clear so fast that you get no force on the equipment. When you don't have that fast clearing time, then you have to brace all of the equipment to be able to withstand all of that current passing through it. That is a very uh, hard thing to do, but when you see equipment that is uh, beefier, it's got more, more hardware to it, more steel, more infrastructure, that is your, that is your equipment being braced to handle possibly multiple cycles of fault current at one time. All right, so I see Mr. Garcia. Can you explain the momentary symmetrical short circuit rating for medium voltage equipment and why low voltage equipment are not assigned a momentary short circuit current rating? All right, so 
there are um, there are ratings associated. Why the heck does it do that? There are ratings associated with the uh, uh, say uh, low voltage equipment, Mr. Garcia. So, for example, if uh, if you went to if you went to the UL standards for see if I have transfer switches are, are are a good example but so are so is busway so so a transfer switch you can purchase a transfer switch that has uh, like a four cycle withstand capability or 30 cycles of withstand and when you look at the transfer switch that's designed to handle or permit 30 cycles of current passing through it you're looking at power circuit breakers or insulated case circuit breakers being built into that equipment. Why do we use those? Because they're designed to hold those contacts closed while current passes through them. And um, let's just look at, um, I'm, I'm going to grab the UL standard for busway as another example. The, um, I'm just looking for, I'm looking for, here we go. I believe bus weighs four cycles, but I need to double check that. I'm looking at the standard, that's dielectric. Verification, there's a short circuit withstand test that uh, Busway goes through, as do other pieces of equipment. I'm looking at UL, um, UL 857. And I'm looking for the number of cycles. So a copper, uh, it says copper bus or tube shall have a cross section of not let each bar or tube may be individually reinforced to help it withstand the short circuit forces. The bar or tube shall be secured in place the same manner as the fuse, blah, blah, blah. And I'm looking for the number of cycles. And I'm not seeing it. But I believe it's four cycles. Let's just, uh, let me do a search for cycles. Now that I get into that area, three cycles. So the duration, the dur so this is out of uh, UL 857 for busway. It says the duration of the short circuit current, the short circuit test current for a fitting having no overcurrent device and for a busway not marked for use with an overcurrent device in accordance with uh, clause whatever shall be no less than three cycles. So, a fitting containing an overcurrent device shall be subjected to a short circuit test until the overcurrent device functions. So, three cycles. It tells me that if I am, say I'm doing selective coordination and I'm putting intentional delays in my power distribution system, if, I, if I'm using this equipment and it's three cycle equipment, what do I need to do? I need to make sure that I have a device that's protecting that, that busway that has a clearing time of at least three cycles. If I put that on an insulated case circuit breaker and I added a delay for selective coordination reasons and I added 30 cycles or 10 cycles, that momentary rating would be exceeded. And a lot of people don't realize that it's not just medium voltage equipment that has this momentary rating of available fault current and, and, the, and a required clearing time, the low voltage equipment has that as well. So you've got to look at the manufacturer's information, the manufacturer's instructions, to understand what are the clearing times that you're supposed to have for that equipment. And if you're doing things like selective coordination, 
um, or uh, on the primary of transformers with inrush currents and things of that nature, and you're adding intentional delays at these values of fault currents, then you're going to have to figure out how to address that situation. Rarely do people look at that, and I would say inspectors aren't looking at that. You know what they're looking at? Um, look up the standard you're interested in and check on it. An option for free viewing. Excellent. Michael Hofkin in the house. Yeah, Willie Snyder. It takes a half cycle. So, so here's the thing. You've got to understand all of the equipment that you're applying with regard to its ability to withstand all of those magnetic forces. What we just saw was one cycle, and that's a lot of magnetic forces. So every termination, 110.14, and you, you wonder why we had a focus in the National Electrical Code. A lot of people say, well, you know, uh, they focus on like a receptacle or they focus on areas like that. Uh, but every termination has torque requirements, not just that little 15 and 20 amp receptacle. Those large conductors. That busway, that busway plug that you're using, uh, anything that you are uh, that you're installing, it's going to have to pass current through it and withstand those magnetic forces. Very important piece of the of the puzzle. And when you look at the standards and you look at the, uh, oh, Michael, is it product spec? I think it's UL product spec. I think, uh, but in any case, there are a lot of resources out there from our nationally recognized testing laboratories to help you properly apply products. Okay, so current limitation. We know current limitation. We know what that is and what that and why it's important. Now, let's just look. You know, a lot of people don't, this is another aspect. Um, a, lot of, a lot of people forget when you're looking at a time current characteristic curve, Remember, what is, what is one cycle? One cycle, we have 60 hertz, one over 60, right? Product IQ, thank you. I'm out of coffee, and it was cold. Anyway, when you look at a time current characteristic curve, remember, time is up, one, is up the axis, the vertical axis. Current is across the horizontal. So if I could look, I can look as we get to the left hand side of that fuse curve. As we, as the currents go, as the currents are lower, the longer the clearing time. That's one cycle, 0 0.016 seconds. This is two, six cycles. That's your uh, six cycles is around a half of a second. So there's 30 cycles. So you got 30 cycles, six cycles, one cycle. That's one cycle of current. So, and you can look at the trip curve and say, as the current gets lower, it takes longer to trip inverse time current characteristic curve as the current gets lower the the clearing times get longer and this is on, on a fused circuit breakers are the same same way so proper interrupting ratings for overcurrent protective devices proper short circuit current ratings and remember an overcurrent protective device will have an interrupting rating because it stops the flow of current. But equipment has short circuit current ratings, which do not stop the flow of current. They hold it together under the, um, the magnetic forces. And let's take a look at a, at a circuit breaker curve. So there's one cycle on a circuit breaker curve. There's two cycles. That's about right there and instantaneous. So that uh, busway, which would say a three-cycle type of piece of equipment, as long as I'm in the instantaneous region on a circuit breaker, I'm good to go. 
but what don't I have on busway when I'm selectively coordinating? If my bolted fault current is less than the instantaneous pickup of the upstream device, I'm probably not in a three cycle type of uh, delay. There's six cycles. And there is 10 cycles. So the short time delay on this circuit breaker has up to 10 cycles of clearing time. That'll translate into electrical, um, electrical energy, incident energy. And there's your, there's a, all right, so there's a six cycle. So remember I said there was a three cycle. Well, it looks like on um, low voltage, on this example of low voltage busway, you can purchase six cycle short circuit current ratings. So they have a six cycle uh, busway. And there's your values of fault current. And that remember that six cycles is right around in that ballpark. So I, I could use a short time delay, but I'd have to bring that down lower uh, to, uh, to, to be able to serve those loads. So be mindful that equipment will have that, Mr. Garcia, um, that value. There's your 845 motor control centers. Look at this one. So this is representative AC motor control center samples, uh, not less than three electrical cycles. So there's three cycles. When an integral or separate overcurrent device limits shall be three cycles. The duration of the test shall be three cycles. So equipment has a duration, has a withstand capability. And they'll tell you how much time you're going to be permitted to let that current flow. All right. <clears throat> now. Let's talk interrupting rating. Now remember, electrical equipment has short circuit current ratings. That's the ability of the equipment to hold it together while current passes through it. And I'll give you an, an instance of what happens when All right, so here is what happens when you exceed the short circuit current rating. So this is the available fault currents at 35,000 amps, and this equipment is only rated for a short circuit current rating of 5,000 amps. It looks like my shirt that looks like my shirt after a good Thanksgiving dinner, okay? Um, how about, how about this one? 65,000 amps. That door went like 25 feet in the lab. How about this one? Plastic enclosure. All right, so so you see that this 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 uh, lug that's right here that tells you that the the fault the short circuit was external. This equipment could not hold it together. The components inside couldn't hold it together under those magnetic forces that basically we achieved an unintended rapid disassembly in the field. Willie, okay? We achieved an unintended rapid disassembly in the field because the components, the circuit breaker held it together. But the individual compounds, we let too much energy through, too much, it was too slow of an opening time to protect those components that are inside that unit. <laughs> URDITF. Thank you, Felix. An unintended rapid disassembly in the field. All right. So that is that's the um, that is short circuit current ratings. Okay. Receptacles have short circuit current ratings. 
if you go to UL um, 508A, they'll give you a table. They'll t give you some examples of, uh, of equipment with minimum short circuit current ratings when you don't have a label. So NEC Article 100 talks about the overcurrent device, overcurrent protective device, and and if NEC and 110.9 is our interrupting ratings, this tells you that the interrupting rating of an overcurrent protective device has to be greater than the available fault current at its line side. And if you don't do that correctly, you get an unintended rapid disassembly of a circuit breaker or a fuse. So these are misapplications of the overcurrent protective device. When they are applied in an area where the available fault current exceeds their interrupting rating, you misapplied the product, and it's only when it's called upon to clear that you'll get that type of performance. So Willie Snyder, Mr. Snyder, let's see, you had a question. There's Mr. If busway feeds a panel board, can you use the upstream current limiting fuse up over and down method to decrease the short circuit current rating of the busway? Uh, well, you, okay, Mr. Garcia, you can use up over and down for busway. Perfectly fine. Because busway is a static piece of device. And what we mean by up over down, let's talk about that real quick. Up over down, if we remember that that um, let through curves, for those of you who aren't familiar, remember this curve. Okay, up and over gives me the peak. If I go up to that 200 amp line, come over to the AB line, the AB line, hey, look at that. If I come up and over to the AB line and then back down again, that gives me my RMS let through. As long as that let through is less than the short circuit current rating of the busway, I am good. I can use up, over, and down as long as it's not a dynamic device, as long like a circuit breaker, its contacts will start to part and try to open. Contactors are dynamic devices. I can't use up, over, and down to determine the protection of devices that are going to start their contacts open. Busway, fair game on up, over, down. Great question, Mr. Garcia. Mr. Snyder, so was the cable whip reduced by accurately predicting the zero crossing? Uh, no. No. Uh, the, the cable whip was reduced because... We reduced the peak from 58,000, that peak value from 58,000 without the fuse, down to 12,000 with the fuse. And we reduced the amount of time. So we, haven't, we didn't even hit the zero crossing. Think about that, Willie. We did not even hit the zero crossing. We stopped the flow of current well before you would have hit that zero crossing because if you would have hit the zero crossing, then you would have gone for at least a half cycle. We stopped the flow of this current within a quarter cycle because of that overcurrent protective device. Okay, so hopefully that answered your question. Um, Mr. Hofkin, yes, table SB 4.1. Even if Busway is feeding panel boards, yes, Mr. Garcia, because you're not trying to protect the panel board. What you're using the fuse for is to protect the short circuit current rating of the busway. Now, the panel board, you can you can protect, you can't use up, over, and down. It can be a series rated circuit for the panel board and the overcurrent devices that are in that panel board. Uh, you can try to do that. But when it comes to that panel board, you can't claim protection of the panel board based upon that fuse be using up, over, and down. So 
the, the panel board, I would say, either has to be fully rated by the fault current, or it has to be series rated with that fuse upstream, uh, but not using up, over, and down, using uh, tables that are available from, go out to the UL website for uh, those, uh, uh, for that equipment, go to the manufacturer, look up that yellow book, it'll tell you what fuse has to be, or circuit breaker, has to be upstream. All right, so hopefully that answered your great questions, Mr. Garcia. I love it. That's what it's all about. That's how we learn together, my brother. All right, so let's go back to interrupting rating. We already saw that when you exceed the interrupting rating, a, a severe misapplication of the product will achieve an unintended rapid disassembly in the field. And from a 70E perspective, think about that. The electrical worker is relying on this device for arc flash reduction. And if, it, if you exceed the interrupting rating and you achieve this type of a performance, you are not going to provide safety. You're not going to provide arc reduction for that electrical worker. That's why 70E, 70E requires that 70E requires that you that you so normal operating condition so energized work 110.4 in 70e tells us that normal operation of electrical electric equipment shall be permitted where a normal operating condition exists a normal op Operating condition exists when all of the following conditions are satisfied. One, the equipment is properly installed. This is not equipment that is properly installed. This is not equipment that's properly installed. You're exceeding the interrupting ratings. NEC 240.60 and 83 tells us what the minimum when you don't have a label on it. But all of our equipment is going to have uh, uh, interrupting ratings. And notice over here on the circuit breaker, we have different interrupting ratings for different voltages. Voltage is pressure. So when you're looking at, um, at a fuse or a circuit breaker or the short circuit current rating of a piece of equipment, voltage matters. It's very important for us to make sure that we are using the right numbers based upon the voltage at which it's being applied. Very important piece of the puzzle. All right. I'm going to go one last item. Series ratings, because we mentioned it. Mr. Garcia, we talked about series ratings. This is a fully rated system. Everything is 65,000 amps. Uh, all of the breakers in here can interrupt 65,000 amps. For an available fault current of 31,400, they are all more than capable of stopping the flow of that current. But what happens when I have downstream breakers being 10,000 amps and 65 amp, 1,000 amp interrupting rating upstream breaker, when we, when, we, when we have a series rated system, you're going to have a, a document that says these two breakers, that 65K and that 10K, both can interrupt together that up to 65,000 amps. And remember how we test these. We test these, both devices are in series with each other. They both see the same amount of current. Now the challenge that comes into play whenever you think about the code is they will remind us that if I have motor contribution in between these two breakers, meaning the downstream breaker is gonna see more current than the upstream breaker, I've never tested it that way and they give us a permission for only a percentage of that current. Now let's take a look. 24086A, you, have to, uh, you can, uh, for existing systems, you can do a series, uh, engineer the system, but the downstream breaker has to remain passive. Very hard to do with molded key circuit breakers. Power circuit breakers, sure thing. Power circuit breakers, I know those contacts are gonna be closed for up to 30 cycles, possibly right? I can show those for the power and insulated case. I might be able to engineer a series ratings, but for 
Uh, motor case circuit breakers, when you're in the instantaneous region, forget about it. Motor contribution limits, 1% of the circuit breaker interrupting rating. That downstream device, that's how much motor contribution, no more than that. You have to field mark it. There's your series ratings uh, in 24086, A, B, and C. And I'm going to focus you in on these are your tested pairs. There's your upstream device. There's your downstream device. This tells you what interrupting rating you're looking for and which devices have to be paired together. But this is what everybody misses right here. I'm going to show it to you. <clears throat> when you are when you are considering a series rated system, we assume the fault current that flows through the top breaker equals to the, is equal to the fault breaker that's flowing through the downstream breaker. But when you introduce motors, in that case, you have motor contribution in between. That means more current will flow through the downstream device than the upstream device, and we've not tested that way. So the code limits the amount of motor contribution you are permitted. I can't tell you how many times that is missed in, the power, in these power distribution systems when they series rate. Your motor full load currents cannot exceed 1% of the interrupting rating of the lower rated circuit breaker. Only 1%. So you have to add up your full load amps, and you can't exceed 1%. And I'm telling you, that little tidbit of information, unfortunately, is missed many times when people are doing series rated systems. All right. Mr. Snyder, if it's a code compliant install installed panel, would it be a risk category one, open a hinged panel cover? Risk category one. I haven't heard that in a long time, Mr. Snyder. Um, there is no more in 70E hazard risk categories. Um, if you're thinking PPE category one, uh, how you would use the tables, you first determine whether or not there's, a, there's an arc flash hazard. So we go to table 130.5 Charlie to determine if the likelihood of occurrence of an arc flash. So it's a code compliant installed panel. Would it be a risk? Would, it, would, would, it, would you have a likelihood of an arc flash event to open a hinged panel cover? I would say a hinged panel cover. Are you exposing energized parts? Is that hinge... Uh, exposing you to energized parts because if it is opening hinge doors or covers or removal of bolted covers for DC systems this includes bolted covers such as uh, to, uh, to expose bare energized electrical conductors and circuit parts any equipment condition likelihood of occurrence is yes so I would use table 130.5 C to estimate the likelihood and then if I use the table method or the PPE category method, if I want to say things correctly, then I would go to 130.7 Charlie 15 Alpha, and I would determine my arc flash PPE category based upon the voltage and all that jazz, and my bond boundaries. If I'm using a label, then I would read the label, and I would dress per 130.5 George. And that is all I got to say about that. All right, everybody, it's 1 o'clock. It's 103. I went three minutes over. But I hope we had a quick discussion about equipment protection. We know, I'm hoping that you understand equipment protection is about the installation, proper installation, ampere ratings, interrupting ratings, short circuit current ratings. Um, if there's no energized parts exposed, Mr. Snyder, then you don't have a, a hazard of exposed parts. But remember, if you don't have any energized, if it's properly installed and you're opening the cover to see the, say, the circuit breakers and there's still a dead front, all that jazz, there's no exposed energized parts, there's no hazard. And that is in 70E as well. Um, 70E says, 70E says, um, the hazards, remember, um, we just read that section, 110.4, normal operating conditions. So it's properly installed, properly maintained, and the equipment is used with 
with the instructions included in the listing and labeling in accordance with manufacturer's instructions. The equipment doors are closed and secure. All equipment covers are in place and secured. There is no evidence of impending failure. Now, if you open an outside door to see uh, the circuit breakers, and turn things on and off, you're perfectly fine. There is no like, there's no hazard as long as you have proper normal operating conditions. So it's all about condition of maintenance and jazz. So hopefully, so we talked we talked a little bit about 70 installation. We talked about maintenance and we talked about safe work practices. They all work together for electrical safety. Hopefully you got something out of that. I really appreciate appreciate you uh, tuning in for this session of IAEI News Live. Thank you for all that you uh, do for electrical safety. Thanks for what you do for the electrical industry to remember, be safe and please stay healthy.